Do minority groups in the United States distrust American mainstream media? Hello, I'm Arnold Nido, and this is The Heat. Nearly two-thirds of black Americans say news coverage of black people is more negative than it is for other ethnicities, according to the Pew Research Center. Factors such as outlets pushing their own agendas, journalists not being well informed, lack of diversity and racism in newsrooms were cited in that report. So how can journalists be better equipped to navigate issues impacting black people? And what can networks do to regain their trust? To discuss this and more, let's bring in our guests. Joining us here in Washington, D.C., Rafael Bernal is a staff writer at The Hill. Clarence Lussain is a professor and former chairman of the Department of Political Science at Howard University. In Delaware, Brandon Bryce is a columnist, media personality, and conservative talk show host of The Bryce is Right. And Imani Cheers serves as the interim senior associate provost for undergraduate education at George Washington University and is an associate professor of media and public affairs. Welcome to all of you. Imani, let me start with you. Well, we just talked about that report uh, done by Pew Research. It says almost two-thirds of black Americans say the coverage of them and their communities is more negative than any other group. Does that surprise you? Um, actually, it doesn't. I think that it's very accurate, the Pew research findings that really indicated what many people in the black community have known for well over 100 years, is that the media portrays um, black people focusing primarily on stereotypes, stereotypes really set, built, created in white supremacy. And those stereotypes continue until present day, uh, demonizing um, black men, women, and children historically. And unfortunately, um, we still have a serious issue within our mainstream media about unbiased, accurate coverage. Rafael, uh, nearly 5,000 people were surveyed, uh, just under 5,000, I should say, in this um, research that was done by Pew. They included black people or black and one other group or black and Latino. Um, it's a cross-section of minorities in the United States. I mean, what are you, is, has your experience been uh, on how minorities are not only covered in the media, but how they're represented in the media? The representation side is, is, is a more difficult issue. Coverage, coverage is really sort of an educational issue. The people who are already in the media could do better. And, and that, you know, that, that could happen tomorrow. It won't, but it technically could. Representation is a much harder, um, much harder challenge. Basically, uh, in, in news media, for instance, uh, you know, the salaries are not the greatest, but the cost of entry is very high. So, so people, people with more privilege go to better schools and get into, into news media easier. Um, and that means, you know, any, any demographic that has higher poverty rates is, is sort of shut out and, and it's just harder to get in. Um, they can't, you know, people can't do internships, for instance. People can't, uh, can't work, essentially can't work for free while they make it into the business. And, you know, that, that has been a challenge. I know uh, the National Association of Black Journalists is great at addressing that issue. Obviously, you know, solving it is a, is a system-wide uh, challenge. The National Association of Hispanic Journalists also is catching up to NABJ, and ABJ has really set the standard there. Um, but, it, but it continues to be a challenge, and it, it, just, and it just reflects economic realities. Just on that question of education that you mentioned, uh, what are the shortcomings? The, well, the, the, the shortcomings are just really the price. I mean, education, journalism education can be like any other, you know, any, any other profession. I, I mean, the education of minorities, you know. It's, it's, it's access. Yeah. You know, it can be good, bad, or so-so, but access to it is very difficult for any group that just has higher rates of poverty. It, it, it comes down, a lot of the times it comes down to money. Yeah. Imani, what are your thoughts on education that we're talking about? You know, journalists having uh, knowledge and being conversant with the people they're covering. 
Well, I, I will say that, you know, the cost of education, we can have a conversation about that. Um, and I do know from not only um, my previous roles at George Washington University, um, but also just being, you know, a student with you know, and a person with three degrees, that education is very expensive. And the reality is that sometimes it is does and price out um, a number of individuals. In particular, um, it impacts uh, minority communities catastrophically. Uh, but the reality is that we do have a number of phenomenal programs, um, a number of HBCUs that do try to make education portable. You know, here in Washington, D.C., we have everything from Howard University. They have a phenomenal journalism program, um, as well as Morgan State University and, and Baltimore and a number of other uh, schools throughout the region um, that provide really stellar top quality um, journalism education. And so education is an issue um, and the cost of it. But the reality is that, you know, this is an industry um, that the barriers, uh, because there's a lot of citizen journalism, the barriers of entry um, are actually less than we we're talking about in some of maybe the other STEM fields. Um, so the reality with coverage is not only do you need more uh, people of color, more minorities, more black um, journalists in the newsroom, but you also need more of those journalists in positions of leadership, in editorial positions. Those are the ones who are really making the decisions on what's being covered, what's not, and where resources in the newsroom go. Clarence, great to have you with us. Welcome to the show. Uh, the Pew Report also found that 4 in 10, or 39%, say they've seen racist, racially insensitive, or racially problematic news in the media. And here's one example. This is one of the people uh, who was surveyed. It's a 61-year-old black man, and he said this. I'm quoting him. When a white person commits a crime, it's an individual. It's a mental issue. When a black person commits a crime, it's the total community. It's the black community, and it's an indictment on all of us. How prevalent is this? Uh, it's quite prevalent. I think that's very insightful. Uh, one of the things that struck me about the uh, survey was that, in fact, it was done at all. One of the problems we find is that uh, black people and, and other uh, minority communities are not included in the surveys that really kind of determine a lot of how we understand what's going on in the country, uh, as well as what becomes important issues to cover. And so that individual is absolutely right that there are stereotypes uh, that prevail because, in part, we do not cover uh, consistently these communities so that you have a broad view of the range of life that exists uh, in the black community and Latino communities uh, and elsewhere. So you end up with stereotypes. All black young people are seen as threatening. Uh, black women are seen as angry. Uh, black scholars simply don't exist. Uh, if you look at who's brought in to be experts, not just on issues related to uh, these communities, but on broader issues, whether it's foreign yeah. policy, whether it's on environment, uh, whether it's on education, uh, black scholars uh, in these areas simply are not part of uh, those discussions. So there's a wide range of uh, options that simply have been ignored by uh, much of the, the uh, mass media. Brandon, there is, of course, a political dimension to this as well. I mean, looking at political affiliations, 54% of black Republicans and 66% of black Democrats say coverage is negative more often than not. And almost half of respondents in both parties say reporting largely reflects something we've been talking about, stereotypes in, political, uh, in the political sphere. Uh, and it, it's not something new. I mean, we can go all the way back to 1967. There was the Kerner Report, which looked into coverage of urban unrest at that time. And it was scathing in its criticism of how black communities were covered at that time. That's way back in the 60s. What do you make of this? Well, first of all, now, I want to give kudos. You actually have two Howard University uh, graduates talking to you today. You know, I've always said this, you know, the, the first problem with media, going back to the days of Walter Cronkite, is, first of all, actually report the news and let people decide. But when you start talking about the fact that all black people don't vote, don't think alike, where's that perspective? I can tell you right now, Literally, whether you turn on Fox, MSNBC, CNN, 90% of the time you're going to get a liberal conservative, excuse me, a liberal African American talking about black issues. Here's the problem that doesn't make up the majority of African American voters. Yes, a majority of African American voters may vote Democrat, but when you start getting on the issues and start talking about where's the conservative voice 
you barely see it. And I can tell you, this is an opportunity. I've, I've said this as an African-American conservative like myself, black Republicans need a voice in the black community because it's there. But if 90% of what you hear is liberal talking points by you know those folks, you know the Roland Martins, uh, the, the, the Michael Eric Dysons, that does not represent the majority of black views and perspectives, but that's what you see on TV. Imani, hey, that's very important, isn't it? Because there is a tendency to pigeonhole people to say, well, all black people think this way, all white people think this way, or all uh, Hispanic people think this way, whereas it's far more complex, isn't it? Uh, just like any other demographic, you know, African Americans are not a monolith. Um, we don't all think alike. We don't all vote the same. Um, we don't all have the same priority of, of issues. And so I think it is very important, um, as, as um, my co-panelists mentioned, um, that we do have, a, you know, a issue when it comes to, you know, individuals speaking for the majority um, of, any pro of any community. And that is something that we would love to have more of. And I think depending on, I think there's a larger problem here with the look of our media land landscape and where there are voices for moderate, whether it be liberals or Republicans, conservatives or um, Democrats, so we can actually have a conversation where moderates can come together and speak versus everything being on the fringe. Brendan, go ahead. No, no, just going back again, stating my thought on the fact that if you're talking about media, media is such a powerful tool. And if you're going to be fair, all perspectives need to be represented. I mean, we're talking about, you know, the fact that, you know, people that you look at when it comes to what are, what are people, how are people looking at African Americans, not just in the United States, but also abroad, they don't, they may not never ever meet an African American, but they're looking at TV, they're looking at the news, they're looking at what are the, the, the social things that, that make up uh, what an African American eats, what an African American, how we dress, what we say, how we treat our families. And if everything is always negative, then you're going to continue to have this image, not just domestic, but globally, which is why it's so important that when we're talking about urban media specific, you're getting uh, uh, a perspective across the board of whether it's liberal, whether it's conservative, whether it's uh, fiscally conservative, to show the different perspectives. And I can tell you, the media has not done that. Ratings plays also a big role in that is that it's not always what's true, it's what sells. Raphael, talking about education um, and the education of journalists covering the communities mm -hmm. uh, or educating themselves about the communities they cover, uh, this is going a little bit beyond what we're talking about right now, but surely that education doesn't start at university level or college level. It has to start long, long before that, right? It should. It should. But, but we are, I mean, we are fighting as a as a media community, as a, beyond just the business practice, we are fighting against demonizing minorities and against erasing minorities. And that, those two problems start in communities where people are growing up, which is, I guess is that that's the point you're making. Um, but as journalists, and, and a lot of people have been very good at this, and, and, a lot of, uh, and a lot of newsroom leaders have been very good at, at identifying that problem, even if they're, you know, if, if they're not of a minority community, a lot have also been terrible at it. Um, but as journalists, we, we need to understand the, say it's political journalism, we need to understand the country we cover. And if there are two demographics that represent roughly 20% each of the general population, yeah. and we don't understand them, we're not doing our job. You know, even, even if it's not exactly 60% uh, of uh, white Americans, and even if white Americans were a monolith, because all of them, they also were not a monolith. Um, covering 60% of a country is not, you know, it, it, it's not journalism. Clarence, the prominent journalist, uh, Wesley Lowry, he wrote an op-ed piece uh, in the New York Times in 2020. This is what he said, I'm quoting him here. He said, since American journalism's pivot many decades ago from an openly partisan press to a model of professed objectivity, the mainstream has allowed what it considers truth to be decided almost exclusively by white reporters and their mostly white bosses. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think that's fundamentally true. In the uh, 1980s and 1990s, I headed up an organization called the National Alliance of Third World Journalists. And it was a, a network of journalists, uh, both in mainstream media as well as independent media, uh, journalists of color. And pr primarily we were concerned with uh, coverage 
uh, from another perspective uh, on foreign policy as well as on uh, domestic policy. And that was because when you look at who's uh, out there, who's covering all of the issues that are important to the country as a whole, uh, it tends to be very, very uh, exclusive. And as the, uh, that uh, article mentioned, uh, tends to be very white, tends to be very male. And what we end up with then is you have journalists of color, you have women journalists who get uh, segregated uh, into covering issues uh, that only relate to these particular kinds of identities. So it's important not just because of these communities need to be covered, but these perspectives need to be there on all of the issues that are being covered in the media. Brandon, there was also an inter interesting finding in this survey on how people consume news. The report tells us that 41% get their news from local outlets rather than national outlets. They also trust the accuracy of local outlets more than national news. Uh, why do you believe uh, that to be the case? Well, I mean, even if you look at media, I mean, most people get their media now from social media. They get their media um, not necessarily depending on news networks, unfortunately, because it's convenient. The problem is that, is that, is it accurate? You know, there was a studies that said, you know, bloggers are now being trusted by people watching. I mean, they're thinking bloggers, it's all opinionated news. And so the challenge is that I think it's more convenient. Uh, it's faster, where now you can literally go to your uh, Facebook page, your LinkedIn page, news feeds pop up. But the question is, is it accurate? And is it telling the story of maybe your community? Uh, is it telling the actual accurate news? That's a different story. I mean, already people don't trust uh, politics. They don't trust, in some cases, their media form. But right now, what we're seeing is that social media is playing a much more bigger role than just entertainment. People are actually relying on that, and that's dangerous. One other point about politics uh, and the news, uh, Brendan, almost half of black Democrats trust the news, but when it comes to black Republicans, that number drops to almost a third. How do you explain that? Well, it's very simple. Not, you, you, don't, you have very few uh, conservative publications that are telling our story. You know, one of the things I credited, uh, I started with a buddy of mine, a hip-hop Republican, years ago, and it was people were, were, were listening to it because it was a different perspective, but again, it was speaking to their issues. The problem that what we're saying, again, like I mentioned earlier, if you only hear one side when you turn on BET, Fox, MSNBC, that's all that people are going to think that is, exists out there. We know that black people, in some cases, are some of the most conservative communities in the country. So why are their story not being told? Imani, to Brendan's point about uh, social media, I mean, social media in this Pew Research survey scores very low as a reliable source of news, uh, of black news and information, uh, or at least for black consumers. Uh, only 18% said they trust social media, even though, you know, if we look around, there's some pretty reputable uh, news organizations that are online, like The Root, The Grio, uh, Ebony's also uh, runs a site. Mm -hmm. I think the reality is that, yes, we do have um, credible sources in these social media spaces, but the reality is that, that social media still also produces so much mis- and disinformation that it's really hard to, to gain um, accurate um, important um, content when there's so much intentionally there to sow mistrust, to sow distrust, to to spread um, lies, to to over um, emphasize um, issues amongst not only the community but what we're seeing um, in the media. So I wouldn't. I teach social media engagement, and it's one of the things that I'm constantly telling my students. Mo uh, media literacy is a core component of my pedagogy because it's important that our students, as well as uh, consumers of media, understand how to decipher all the information that is coming at us. And it's really difficult to do. If you turn on the television, um, chances are you're more likely um, to find a connection with a reporter than if you were to follow them, same reporter, in their social media space. Rafael, what about uh, minority representation at management level? Because in almost all cases, mm -hmm. the decisions and what is covered and how they're covered is taken at that level. That's, I mean, that, that's part of the, uh, the historical difficulty. Because getting to the management level takes, you know, being a mid-senior career person, and because these filters that didn't allow 
for whatever reason, didn't allow minorities into the newsroom in the first place, you see fewer people at the top. So, if, you know, if, if we were underrepresented at the, um, you know, at the entry level and you take into account attrition, by the time you're getting to the top, there are fewer candidates existent. Add to that that there are obviously still, among many people, attitudes against um, giving, giving management roles, giving leadership roles to Latinos, to African Americans, to, uh, to any, any minority, really. Um, and, and the filter is, is massive. And, and really, the only, the only thing that, that has worked to an extent, to a very small extent, it hasn't worked enough, um, to alleviate that somewhat, is that some of the people in leadership positions, while not being members of minority groups, have understood the, uh, the importance of representation, some more than others. Again, some do it really well, some do it terribly. You know, the other interesting thing that was in that survey was that most people said that they don't believe what we're talking about is going to change soon. It's, uh, it's a slow-moving ship. It's, it is, it is uh, sort of uh, turning the wheel on the Titanic. Um, I, I think the only way for it to change is to keep pressing the issue. Because as long as you keep pressing the issue and, and and talking about the importance of representation, people in, in news media who are doing their jobs well, people in news media management who are doing their jobs well, they will continue to understand the importance of that and hopefully continue to implement some measures to alleviate, alleviate the issue and, and put more people in the pipeline. Clarence, so much has changed in the United States mass media in the last, I uh, would say, 30, 40 years. You know, at one time there were media organizations that just stood by themselves. Now they're all part of huge corporations. Um, in fact, I heard it once described as, you know, you're not playing any big role in society. You're a revenue stream in a big corporation. And I'm wondering to what extent has that contributed to the differences we see in how minorities are covered? Yeah, so I certainly think the uh, cooperation, the uh, corporation of media, uh, where it basically becomes a profit-oriented uh, business, uh, and then that becomes what drives everything. So then it moves towards celebrity and controversy kind of coverage, uh, as opposed to more substantive kind of coverage. And so that really has shaped uh, and drives a lot of what we see in media today. Uh, one of the problems, I think, is that we don't have uh, media watchdogs uh, that can play a role, particularly around some of the issues we're talking about. Uh, for example, back in the 1990s, uh, we in, in Los Angeles, uh, I was doing some work uh, about coverage of young people, uh, young people, African Americans and Latinos in gangs. And the coverage was horrific. Uh, and we ended up meeting with some of the local um, um, stations uh, and gave evidence of how they did their coverage, and that led to some uh, some progress. But it was re it required an outside voice, and that's what's really needed now. Uh, that really documents uh, and puts pressure on these media organizations uh, to do better. Uh, the survey, I think, really does capture the sentiment that's out there now to change uh, that uh, atmosphere. Uh, is going to require uh, pressure. Brendan, there's also the question of what is known as parachute journalism. Um, that's, well, sort of literally flying in a journalist uh, with little knowledge or background to cover an event, and once they've covered that event, and it's normally a disaster of some kind, then they fly back out. Um, is there something to that in the way minorities are covered? Well, but first of all, don't parachute somebody who doesn't look like the community that you're covering. Yeah. Start there. I think the challenge is we need to parachute and help support more people of color in their respective industries to tell their story. You got two, again, I go back to, you got two Howard University graduates on this global network talking about policy issues. And so you can start at the HBCUs, you can start uh, at, you know, at uh, organizations like La Casa La Raza, when you're talking about finding uh, Hispanic talent. The point is, well, this is a talent issue not just a media issue, find the talent to tell the story. Have you come across that? Uh, the difficulty in finding talent to cover a story in a minority area or even in another country? Yes, and, and again, back to the, the issue with wages, I've come across uh, people who have the talent who cannot afford to, to 
basically have a meager wage and, and be expected to live in Washington, D.C., for instance. That uh, sort of the, the um, generational transfers of wealth are, are the door mm -hmm. for many people to enter into news journalism, especially political news journalism that happens in very expensive markets, markets that are very expensive to live in. And so, the, so if, if the starting wages are, are that low and there are no programs to sort of give a helping hand or, or just, uh, just really help get a living wage to, uh, to entry level people, they'll, they'll choose other professions. And, and so that talent, while it exists, it evades the, uh, it evades the industry. Brandon, there also appears to be something of a cosmetics problem, an optics problem in many of the big networks where they do have uh, anchors uh, from, and hosts from minority groups, but they're normally relegated to weekend slots where not many people are watching so, watching. so they can say, well, look, we are fulfilling our diversity issues, but they're not really, are they? Well, again, you know, it goes back to, you know, we're talking about ratings. The unfortunate piece is media has now become a business. And so you want to put people who look good, unfortunately. You want to, uh, you know, the sound bites are what typically sells. Uh, people, and I'll say this carefully, it's, the media has, has left the business of solely telling the truth. They tell the truth as long as it sells the ratings. Again, the business side is, in my, kid, my thoughts, what's really killing the content of good journalism. The other piece of that is, you know, there was a time when uh, journalists, where the story was told, and the viewer had to decide their perspective. Now, we're basing it off of, in some cases, who cuts the bigger check? That's the person, and that's the side of the angle that they're promoting. And again, that's dead wrong, and I think that's the direction media is unfortunately gone. Imani, what about the issue where we, and we have seen this in some big networks in the United States, where black hosts and anchors have been fired. They've lost their jobs because they expressed a view on that network that is not acceptable to what their white bosses or their white managers wanted. Um, yes, I mean, I think one of the most prominent um, in recent uh, years that I can think of is when Mark Lamont Hill, um, who was um, a correspondent on CNN, and he was speaking um, at the National um, Day of Palestinian Solidarity at the UN, um, and therefore he was fired. Um, for for his uh, positions, for his views, for his thoughts, um, not on air. Um, again, I want to express that he was not speaking on air, and it does happen, um, unfortunately, in a number of spaces. We've seen, you know, a powerful, amazing people. Melissa Harris Perry is another person who had a wonderful show on MSNBC, um, and she was uh, ceremoniously fired. We can see Tiffany Cross uh, most recently, um, about a year ago, who also had a show on MSNBC, um, and um, she was removed from her position. So we do have a number, and those are just three examples that I mentioned within the last, I'd say, five to six years of prominent um, African-American journalists um, who were removed from either their show or their position at a network. And these are, I want to point out, liberal networks, CNN and MSNBC. DC, um, and that's a problem. Um, that's a problem where an industry that is supposed to be based on truth, supposed to be based on um, authenticity, and most importantly, on presenting facts, um, unbiased facts, um, that when you have um, hosts, journalists, um, scholars who are in these positions and removed for their, either A, their personal views on uh, what some consider contentious topics, or for a variety of other reasons, um, they'll blame it on ratings and other uh, things that are absolutely absurd. Um, we'll see that that is very intimidating um, for young journalists starting out, trying to get their foot in the door, seeing that some of their mentors um, and uh, individuals that they admire um, being completely, um, you know, removed from their positions for, for absolutely absurd reasons. Okay, and that is where we have to leave it. Thank you to all of you for being with us. That's it for this edition of The Heat. I'm Arnold Naidu in Washington, D.C.